Here we're going to talk about contour mapping. The basic idea is that you have a transfer function. We've been working with these transfer functions. And this S, this input, is a value on the S plane. So you have the real axis and the imaginary axis here. So the idea of a contour mapping is that your input could be a contour. So a set of points, continuous set of points, that makes a, a loop and goes in a certain direction. So here we're having a loop here. You can put that contour into your function and you will get some sort of output that will also be a contour. It may be slightly different, it may change the shape a little bit, and it will also have some sort of direction based on which direction this one is going. So you take your function, you put in a contour, you get a contour out both on the S plane. The function here is made up or can be written just like before. So f of s, just a transfer function like we've looked at before, you can write it as a set of zeros, so z1, s minus z2, etc. however many you have, and a set of poles, s minus p1, p2, and so on. So you can write it in this general form. What we're gonna do is use contour mapping and we're going to look at how the contour will change based on the position and number of poles and zeros. So we're going to have Poro and Valerie help us out with some basic contours mapping. Here we have a makeshift S-plane and here you see our imaginary plane, positive and negative, and then our real axis, negative and positive here. What we're going to do is we're going to look at the contour paths for a few functions. So we're going to start with f of s equals s minus z1. And we're going to use an analogy. The zero here, this location, is going to be the location of this poro. So first we're going to say poro is slightly positive here. And he's looking out this way. This is his location, the zero one. Remember that this can also be thought of as a vector in the, on the, the s-plane from z1, so wherever Poro is looking. And we're going to make another analogy. We're going to say that there's a contour over here, and this contour is Valerie walking in a certain path. Okay, so this is the input function. It's going to be this path, and then it's going to go through this function, and we can think about this function as, from Poro's perspective, if Poro were the origin, where is Valerie walking? So if we put this through the Poro function, this function here is zero, it essentially looks like as if this were the origin. So the output of this function through this function, this input into this function, is actually just going to be shifted. So it's like Poro were here, and this would be what it's viewing. So for example, that's one instance if Poro is in the negative part and our input is here, Valerie is going in a circle here, then the output of the function would be just from Poro's perspective, so it would be shifted by the same amount as Poro. Okay, so this would be the first case where we have Poro is outside of this contour and it would just simply shift with Poro's perspective. We're still working with this function, but this time we're going to assume that the contour, the input contour, is a little bit larger and that Poro is this time, the important part is that Poro is this time in the middle of the contour. So, and he's looking out this way, from his perspective it looks like Valerie is walking around him completely in a big circle. So, if we put this through our function, our Poro is a zero function, then it, the output would simply be, again, shifted. So this time the output would be shifted to the origin. So assume this is our origin point. Then if Poro is in the middle of this contour, then it will move 
and, and then circle the origin. So that's the important part. And in this case, it's going to go in the same direction. So if this is going counterclockwise, the output is also going to go counterclockwise, but it will simply move to shift over and then circle the origin. Now let's look at a system with a single pole. So here's our equation. We have 1 over s minus p, so the p1 is our pole location. And this is a little bit different than our 0. Before we looked at pretty much a straight shifting, so it was a, a straight vector. In this case we have 1 over this system. And two things are going to happen. The distances are going to be inverted. So things that are far away are going to become closer. They're greater than 1, they're going to become less than 1. They're less than 1, they're going to be greater than 1 in terms of this vector distance. The second thing is that because it's 1 over this value and we're in the s-plane, the imaginary part is going to be flipped. So you're going to flip across the imaginary axis. What this means in our analogy is that this point is still where Poro is located, but Poro has some changes. Poro now, he's wearing these excellent inversion glasses that help him see everything in inverted, in inverted form. So if something is farther than 1, he will see it as less than 1, 1 over that value, so 1 over whatever the, the distance is. And the opposite, if it's less than 1, it'll look like it's further away than 1. The second thing is that he's going to actually be upside down in that location. So if our pole location is here, he's going to wear his inversion glasses and he'll be upside down because everything has to be flipped over the imaginary axis. So he's still facing this way, but he's flipped this way. Okay? So if Poro is a pole, this is, he's in, everything's inverted and it's going to be flipped over the imaginary axis. So with that, let's assume we have a contour again. So we have a contour, contour and values going in this direction around it. Let's say that she stopped on this green dot. So in Poro's perspective, she's pretty far away. She's going in this direction. And, but he's flipped over. So he thinks that everything is happening on the other side of the imaginary plane. So what's going to happen is that the contour, the output, if this is your input, your output would look something like this. And in his perspective, she's over here, but he thinks, because he's wearing these inversion glasses, that she's very close. So this green dot, this input, would actually be output over on this side of the imaginary the S plane. As she continues around, try to, she's continuing around, the contour would go this way. And when she stops on the brown dot, Poro thinks that she's very close. Or sorry, she is very close, but because of the inversion, he thinks that she is very far away. And of course, he still thinks she's on the opposite side of the imaginary axis. So as you move around this way, this purple contour would be your input, and your output would be something like this pink one. Note also that she's going clockwise, and here you would still be going clockwise, but it's just shifted, reversed, inverted, and further down. This is for the case where Poro is outside of the contour. We're still working with our pole system, so we have 1 over our s minus p1, our pole. This time our contour is going to be a little bit larger. We're going to assume our pole location, which is our inverted upside down Poro, is located inside the contour. Okay? So again, value is going to walk around in this path. And the output is going to look a little bit different this time. So our output, because we're encircling Poro, in Poro's perspective, we're going around him. So the new one would be located around the origin. So one important point is that the output function is encircling the origin. The second part is, so if we look at, say, Valerie is located at this brown dot over here. Then, in Poro's perspective, she is on the negative side. So she's on a, this point over here. So this would be the output. As she walks in this direction, remember she, everything's upside down. So it looks like she's moving in this direction. And as she gets to the green dot, 
it will be flipped from this side to that side and it will be inverted. As she continues around, we would go in this general direction. You'll notice that this one is clockwise, going this direction, and the output turns out to be counterclockwise. So the two important parts of if you're encircling a pole is that the output function will move around to encircle the origin and the direction, so if this is going clockwise, this is going to go counterclockwise and vice versa. So the direction will flip when you encircle a single pole. Now we're going to look at a system with one zero and one pole. I don't have enough poros to fit on this very small table, but let's assume that we have one zero, so this is a normal poro, and then one pole, so we have our flipped over inverted glasses wearing poro as the pole. And Valerie is still walking around in this, on this contour, and this contour is encircling our zero and pole. The output is going to look like this. So as she moves around, the perspectives of both the zero and the pole are actually going to cancel out such that this output contour does not encircle the origin. And it just happens following the brown dot and the green dot that the, the system will be flipped in the opposite direction. The general rule that we can learn from these contours is that if you have equal of number of zeros and poles inside the contour, your system will not encircle the origin. It will encircle the origin if you have either more poles than zeros or more zeros than poles. So we're going to use this and bring it back to stability and look at the Nyquist criterion. So we looked at all these different examples where we had a zero or a pole inside or outside of this contour. What can we learn from this and how can we use this in the Nyquist criterion? The important thing we want to learn from this or take away from this is that we can build a relationship between, on the input side, the number of encircled poles or zeros, so the number of poles or zeros that are encircled in here, and on the output side, so when it goes through this function, the encirclement of the origin. So the origin point, how many times and in what direction does it encircle this, the origin? So let's build a really simple relationship so we're going to say z here, we call this the number of encircled zeros, and we're going to have a p-value. This p is going to be the number of encircled poles, and we know that, let's start with this case, let's start when, when they are equal. So when the zeros and poles are equal, we saw from the last case that the pole and zero, essentially, they cancel each other out. So in terms of encirclements, we get zero, no, no encirclements of the origin. So let's look at the other cases. So if we have more zeros than poles, so the zero and pole are going to cancel each other out, and the remaining zeros will result in encirclement of the origin in the same direction. In the Nyquist criterion, we're always going to be looking at the input as a clockwise. So in this case, we would say it would be clockwise. Okay, so this is same direction. It's always going to Input's always going to be clockwise for the Nyquist criterion, so if it's clockwise, we know that there are more zeros in circle than poles. So look at the other case. What if there are fewer zeros than poles? Then we are still going to encircle the origin. This is like the case when we had this one pole, but we're going to go in the opposite direction. So if we assume our input is always going to be clockwise, 
In this case, it would be counterclockwise. Okay, so from this, we're going to use this general principle to apply the Nyquist criterion and look at systems stability.